At this unassuming fire station in Livermore, California, just outside of San Francisco, something's been burning for 115 years. In fact, for much of the last century, the firefighters have been actively trying to keep it from going out. Tom Bramble is one of those firefighters. He agreed to show us what has come to be called the Centennial Bulb. It's a light bulb, just a regular electric light bulb, except that in the past 115 years, it's only been turned off a couple times, making it the longest burning light bulb in the world. The longest burning light bulb ever? Ever in the world. Wow. That's a big deal. Let's, let's do a video about it. Today's compact fluorescent light bulbs, the ones that you might have in your house like I do, because I like to see, can last up to 10,000 hours. Some LED lights can last up to 50,000 hours. In contrast, incandescent bulbs, which I don't currently have any of for visual aid, can last only about 1,200 hours. But the Centennial Bulb has lasted over a million hours. What? Is that the bulb right there? That's the bulb. Oh, wow. It's just, it's just right there. It's just right there. It's unassuming, yeah, 24 hours a day, quiet, a, doesn't do anything. It's just sitting just right fine. there. I, I imagine there being some it's, sort of it's unprotected. case or shrine. It's just hanging right there. Yeah, well, we, we've talked about that over the years. <laughs> how do you protect this thing? Yeah. But it's done fine on its own for over a century now. That's longer than the lifespan of most people. It's hard to imagine the amount of change that's happened since that light bulb turned on. Two world wars, the development of the atomic bomb, we landed on the moon, 25 different Zelda games, the invention of the cronut, the internet. Since the centennial bulb was first manufactured, about three billion people have been born and died. The Chicago Cubs even won the World Series in that time, granted way at the beginning of the time frame. All right, so then now the question is, the, the big question is why? Why is it staying on? Why isn't it burning out? What is it? Uh, you know, um, <laughs> it, we have to take a guess sometimes that it's just a, a little freak of nature with the, and the development of it, but yeah. they did make quality bulbs at that time. You gotta remember way back when this bulb was first made, most people didn't even have electricity. They used gas or kerosene lamps for light. Electric lamps were a new technology. Light bulbs were a big deal. You could say they were novel. So they were novel. It was yeah. a novel concept. And that's why it was celebrated here when, in 1901 when it was donated. It was a big deal. Yeah. Because then the host cart stations and whatnot, there was no light. Yeah. They had to go at nighttime if they had a fire, they'd go to the station light the lanterns and the kerosene lamps, put them on, get the horses yeah. hooked up. And that's but a fire hazard at the fire station. They right were, that was a hazard at the station. <laughs> so when they got that dim light, yeah. it lit up the station. It was, you know, you could have had a floodlight out there been <laughs> comparable at the time. Yeah. So light bulbs were a luxury back then, so they were taken care of a little bit better. But that doesn't explain why this light bulb lasted for so long. It was manufactured by Shelby Electric. They were one of the major manufacturers in the day. They had what they called the uh, greatest lamp in the world, mm -hmm. and they really did. What is, do you know what it's made of? What, what these light bulbs? Yeah, this is a carbon filament that they had a baking process that Shelby had, secret process. They suggested at the time that the carbon was baked to a hardness uh, as hard as a diamond. Shelby kept in business till about 1912. They sold to General Electric. Go figure, right? Yeah. You make a light bulb that lasts forever. You <laughs> eventually you're gonna go out of business. But the the products that they were making were made to last, and truly this one really has. Yeah. And and obsolescence is a built-in function in, okay. in many many products that we have today. So does that? Um, so what you mean is the company's plan to have products end? And actually that did take place in the 20s, in about 1923 or four, yeah. um, there was a cartel called the Phoebus Cartel. And that okay. was a planned obsolescence by a lot of the major companies. Okay, so what he's talking about sounds crazy, but this really happened. The Phoebus Cartel was a group of light bulb manufacturers that got together and agreed to shorten the lifespan of their bulbs. So they were like, hey man, wanna shorten your bulbs? They did this so that they could sell more light bulbs. They had scientists working around the clock designing light bulbs that would last no more than a thousand hours. If one of these manufacturers made bulbs that lasted longer, they could face a fine from the Phoebus cartel. That's crazy. But it's real. 
These kinds of manufacturing techniques aren't limited to light bulbs. Everything from cars or appliances to computers have obsolescence built in. It's called planned obsolescence. Although the term had been used earlier, it was first popularized by Brooks Stevens in a speech at an advertising conference in 1954. But he didn't mean for it to refer to a deliberate design of an inferior product. He was referring to another kind of planned obsolescence where the manufacturer influences the consumer to make them think that their product is inferior. We see this all the time, from cars to phones to TVs to computers to blenders coffee grinders to, uh... With each new model or upgrade, we're encouraged to buy it because we're told it's better than what we already have. And planned obsolescence isn't just bad for our bank accounts. Every phone, car, computer that we discard will likely end up in a landfill. But we shouldn't put all the blame on manufacturers. Consumers often want newer, fancy, dancier kind of things, and manufacturers are just giving in to demand. That's capitalism. And planned obsolescence isn't always a bad thing. One of the first appearances of the idea was in a pamphlet called Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence. In it, the author argued that planned obsolescence would stimulate the economy by increasing consumption. That makes sense. In some ways, it does just that. It keeps businesses in business and employees employed by always having to build and supply a new product. It can create jobs and foster innovation. Well, at least the Phoebus cartel is gone and light bulbs seem to be getting better. They may not last as long as the Centennial bulb, but compact fluorescents and LEDs are a giant leap forward from the incandescent bulbs of the past, right? Right? The same thing kind of applies today when you want to talk about obsolescence. It's yeah. a little annoying in a, in a sense, but if you think about it, the light bulbs, the LEDs are 25,000 to 50,000 hours, and they're supposed to last 14, 15 years. The average person only stays in their house seven years, so, yeah. and they move. You know? <laughs> so how many people are saying, well, this one lasted nine, only nine years, I'm going to go back to the manufacturer? Nobody's looking at that. But technically, we could all build bulbs as good as this well, and just could. have light all the time. You could. We could do that. So why don't we? That's a question. That's another segment for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just so weird that like we could we could just have have them last. Well, and cars could last longer. Like everything could everything probably could last, last longer. longer but but, uh, but you got that obsolescence. Is you got to consider that for the economy. For the I guess. Economy. <laughs> when do you think it'll go up? I don't know that it w will expire in my lifetime. But okay. um, we know that everything has an end. Yeah. Sometime. You know. Someday it'll expire. Maybe but long after knows? all humans are gone. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, who knows? It could last another 100 years. Wow. You know? Easily. So what do you think? Is planned obsolescence good or bad? If it's bad, how are we going to keep the light bulb manufacturers and car manufacturers and all mm, people who make things employed? If it's good, what are we going to do with all the waste? Is there a better way to supply the population with consumer goods without having to artificially enforce a lifespan on products? Let us know in the comments. Also, if you want to see the Centennial Bulb for yourself, there is actually a 24-hour live stream linked right down there in the doobly-doo. Please consider liking and subscribing, and thanks to the Kickstarter and Patreon supporters for making this video possible. You're great. Planned obsolescence, more like planned obsobestence, am I right? Oh, please don't unsubscribe after I said because I said that. Last week we talked about gravitational waves. You guys had a lot to say, so uh, let's take a look at some of those comments. David Treader pointed out that we say gravity waves several times throughout the video, which is actually a much different thing from gravitational waves. Apparently, gravity waves are actually waves that are created at the interface between two media, like air and water. So ocean waves are actually an example of gravity waves, and gravity is just pulling the waves back down. Um, Okay. So that's what a gravity wave actually is. Also, actually, we, we actually followed up with Daniel Holtz about this, and apparently like a lot of physicists say gravity waves are just kind of like shorthand. So we're just, in the context, if you know what you're talking about, it's like... Yeah, we're basically physicists. We're basically physicists. We're actually not physicists. We're not experts, but uh, no. we're just doing the best we can. We're just so. curious young chaps. Paul Christo questioned whether the uh, detection of gravitational waves was valid since they only detected it once. That kind of goes against the scientific method. Yeah, well, I, have I got news for you? Sorry to cut you off. Sorry. They discovered a second instance of gravitational waves. Right, the, they announced it the day after our video came out. On December 26th of last year, they discovered another instance of a black hole collision uh, and it, it was similar to the other discovery, but the black holes were smaller. Mm. But the cool thing is, because the black holes were smaller, they actually, the collision was detected by the um, LIGO for a longer period of time, so they're actually able to get more information, like kind of where the collision happened in the sky. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And it's just extra evidence of black holes and gravitational waves. At the end of the video, Daniel Holtz mentioned the possibility of detectors in the future being sensitive enough to detect gravitational waves from the Big Bang. Uh, Sam Ram DeBest pointed out, though, that 
Uh, wouldn't it be possible that the gravitational waves from the Big Bang have passed us already and that we're not going to be able to detect them? Well, the short answer is that the Big Bang actually didn't really just like happen in a place, like a specific location. It's not like it happened over there and that's the center of the universe and that's where the Big Bang happened. What about over there? Possibly. Actually, okay. no. No, it didn't. Okay. Because what happened was the Big Bang happened everywhere because it was the entire universe. So it was like the entire universe exploded. And so what we should expect to find are gravitational waves going every direction, basically constantly. So it's less like the collision of two black holes and more like um, the ocean waves during a storm where there's lots of waves and it's chaotic and some of them cancel out but there's always going to be waves left over and they're basically going to be there forever. So the Big Bang happened there. Right there. And this it, is the exact it spot. Here it happened well. there and there. Yeah, and, and there. And right there. Next week we're going to revisit one of our favorite topics, beer, once again, and figure out why American beer has that tends to have less flavor than other beers. Well, traditionally, like the, the major American beer manufacturers, their beers are somewhat light. Yeah, and why we can thank Jimmy Carter for the the resurgence of microbrews, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy Carter. Thank you, Jimmy. Jim, Jimbo. 